this month, the fine folk over on Patreon decided they wanted to hear me talk about what could have happened if the Battle of the Philippine Sea had involved Admiral Lee taking up the opportunity for a battleship fight. Now, I mentioned this in passing during the video on Admiral Lee himself, but to provide a bit more context as to why this is being asked, because of course historically the battle is known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shooter encounter almost exclusively between aircraft from different aircraft carriers, I'm going to start out by reading the relevant passage from Paul Stilwell's excellent Battleship Commander book, which is of course uh, the latest and greatest biography on Admiral Lee, and it deals with how this situation both arose and then obviously didn't arise. So, with the American approach to the Marianas, the prospect of an invasion so close to the Japanese homeland was too grave to go unchallenged. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa's force at Tawi Tawi in the Philippines and Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki's at Batjan in the Dutch East Indies both fueled with unrefined oil. They sortied on the 13th of June and headed for a rendezvous east of the Philippines. That same day, Lee and a coterie of seven fast battleships joined by a number of destroyers left the carrier groups to deliver the first surface ship bombardment of the islands of Saipan and Tinian. Saipan was to be the first of the Marianas to be invaded by US forces. Tinian would come later. Tinian would prove to be the base for Army Air Force B-29s launching heavy bombing raids on the Japanese home islands. The old battleships were not scheduled to arrive for shore bombardment until the following day, and so Lee's ships got first crack. Uh, their crack was a dud, as Samuel L Elliot Morrison assessed the event. Sad to relate, the bombardment of 13th of June was a failure. The new battleships had not had sufficient practice in the slow, deliberate process of focusing on individual targets. Nor were the float planes of Lee's ships experienced in distinguishing targets, observing the fall of shot, and sending appropriate corrections to the firing ships. The fast battleships method, Morrison noted, differed considerably from the type of fire used against other ships. Thus, most of the 16-inch and 5-inch projectiles went wide. A sailor with a sense of humour summarised the 13th of June operation as a Navy-sponsored farm project that simultaneously ploughs the fields, prunes the trees, harvests the crops and adds iron to the soil. On the afternoon of the 17th of June, with the Japanese fleet approaching in an attempt to stymie the attempts by the Americans to strengthen their foothold on Saipan, Admiral Spruance sent out his battle plan in a message to Lee and Mitcher. Our air will first knock out enemy carriers, then will attack enemy battleships and cruisers to slow or disable them. Battle line will destroy enemy fleet if enemy elects to fight, or by sinking slowed or crippled ships if enemy retreats. Action against the enemy will be pushed vigorously by all hands to ensure complete destruction of his fleet. Destroyers running short of fuel may be returned to Saipan if necessary for refueling. Spruance then specified that Mitchell would be in tactical command for the operation. He and Lee were to seek the best methods for engaging the Japanese under advantageous conditions. At 0400 on the 18th of June, Mitchell and Lee received a scouting report from the submarine Kavala that showed the Japanese fleet heading east towards Saipan at 19 knots. As Mitchell's chief of staff, Commodore Arlie Burke, tried to urge Lee's forces into a surface action against the Japanese. Burke was aggressive and experienced in surface tactics. He believed that Lee's ships were well-trained and battle-hardened, and that Lee would be eager to take on the Japanese fleet. On Mitchell's behalf, he sent a dispatch to the battleship commander. Do you seek night engagement? It may be we can make air contact late this afternoon and attack tonight. Otherwise, we should retire eastward tonight. Lee demurred with an emphatic message that left no doubt as to his preference. Do not repeat not believe we should seek night engagement. Possible advantages of radar more than offset by difficulties of communications and lack of training in fleet tactics at night. Would press pursuit of damaged or fleeing enemy, however, at any time. Historian Clark Reynolds reported that both Mitcher in command of Task Force 58 and many officers on Nimitz's staff in Hawaii were most disappointed because Nimitz had emphasised the importance of destroying the Japanese fleet. Admiral Lee doubtless recalled the confused close-quarters action off Guadalcanal and that the Japanese were skilled at night operations. As his aide, Guil Artson, put it, You have to recognise that if you're going to be the father protector for the carrier task force and the air arm is going to be the one that really does the job, 
you don't have the time to train yourself and your ships to a level of sharpness that surface ships operating on their own would require. From Artisan's perspective, Lee knew that he was performing a valuable function in protecting the carriers, though he was not happy in playing second dog. He did, however, recognise the realities of the situation and the obligation they conferred. In a sound recording he made ten months after the battle, Commodore Burke summarised the exchange of messages in rather prosaic language. He did, however, add a further possibility that might have occurred. We could choose the time of attack. We could fight either during the night or the next morning. He added, we also received a dispatch from the commander of 5th Fleet which stated that Task Force 58 must cover Saipan and our forces engaged in that operation, and that he felt the main enemy attack would come from the westward but it might be diverted to come in from the southwestward. Well, we thought so too. In an interview with this author, that's uh, Paul Stilwell, 32 years after the battle, Burke was much less restrained than in his sound recording of 1945. He complained that Lee was not one to volunteer opinions and suggestions. He did not view it as a defect in Lee, but instead as Lee's complete understanding of the responsibility of command. Burke said of Lee's decision not to engage... I was amazed that Admiral Lee did not want to do that. He did concede that Lee was concerned about being involved in a melee and that such an engagement could take place only at night. This contradicted his view in the 1945 recording that the battle could have taken place in the daytime. Burke did say that he was not criticising by tying the decision to Lee's sense of caution and the fact that being linked to the carriers had not provided many opportunities to exercise independent command responsibility. He added, though, you can never outguess another man. Dr. Alan Millett, distinguished professor of history at the Ohio State University, considered that Lee's explanation was really an excuse for having cold feet, not being willing to take the sort of risks that aviators and submariners did in routinely during the war. Lee had remained in the battle area, so he would be in a position to engage the Japanese surface fleet, but in this instance declined when the opportunity was presented. Admiral Spruance was cautious about letting his ships stray too far from Saipan, lest they leave the beachheads vulnerable to a Japanese attack from a separate force that could slip in behind. Burke's suggestion that Lee might take out the he enemy heavy combatants in the morning was at odds with the Japanese preference for night action. The idea that the American fleet could have chosen the time for the engagement is unlikely. The Japanese had the option to advance or retreat as it suited their purposes. As Clark Reynolds wrote... Lee had a healthy respect for night torpedo attacks by destroyers and submarines. He also said that Spruance had naive assumptions, even after the Gilberts and Truck, that a surface action was possible during daylight with carrier aircraft present. Spruance's handling of the New Jersey at Truck in February had nearly come a cropper. Reynolds, who well appreciated the power of naval aviation by this point in the war, added... Being a formalist, like Lee, leaving nothing to chance, Spruance then quickly supported Lee's decision and agreed to the alternative, a night retirement towards Saipan. Little did these battleship wean tacticians realise that only at night could a pure surface action take place in the presence of fast carrier forces. Among those who criticised Lee's decision not to engage the Japanese heavies was historian Malcolm Weir, who reported that some officers on board Lee's ships expressed surprise at their commander's decision. Lieutenant Frank Pinney was assistant gunnery officer of the Iowa during the Marianas campaign. Years later, he wrote to Muir, I recall the stated reason for not sending the fast battleships to look for the Japanese in the Philippine Sea battle was a lack of practice in night engagements. As far as my gunnery department was concerned, all our engagements, except for shore bombardments, had been night shoots against Japanese planes, and the main battery under full radar control couldn't have cared less whether it was day or night. I believe the other gunnery officers felt the same way. On the afternoon of 18th of June, Mitcher arranged his various carrier task groups to be prepared for the following day's actions. Burke, acting for Mitcher, deployed the battleships to the west of the carrier formations, that is, closer to the Japanese. Burke said he wished he had received more input from Lee regarding the deployment. Burke's reasoning was that it would suck in the planes against a hell of a hard anti-aircraft target. Task Force 58 would also provide air cover for Lee's heavy ships. One result of that positioning came the following day when the Alabama provided the first radar detection of the approaching Japanese planes at a range of about 190 miles. Lee asked the Iowa to confirm the contact, which she did at 130 miles. 
Following the engagement, Lee saluted both ships. To Iowa, well done. To Alabama, very well done. Burke recalled that he probably asked Lee if he had an opinion regarding positioning the battleships to the west, and Lee didn't offer one. Afterward, Lee conceded that putting them there was a good idea. On the 19th of June, Lee had set up the anti-aircraft screen in a circular formation with the Indiana in the centre as guide. There were six more battleships and a covey of cruisers and destroyers. It was a day that would gain the nickname the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot because of the one-sided results of the action. The Japanese lost more than 350 aircraft to the shooting of American pilots and anti-aircraft gunners on board ships. An onslaught of Japanese carrier planes came toward Task Force 58 off Saipan. The US fighter planes had a field day sending enemy pilots to the afterlife. So there you have it. Broadly, why Lee made the decision and what some people have said about it thereafter. Personally, my point of view is that Lee probably made the right call. He is in the best position to decide at that point how experienced his ships are in surface-to-surface training and night training in particular. He knows already how good the Japanese are because he's been at the receiving end of it. And, well, from the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, he's perfectly aware that one of the reasons that South Dakota was still with the fleet was because the Japanese had started out that particular fight loaded with Type 3 bombardment shells and not AP shells. Granted, they had switched to AP shells thereafter, but you know, one Congo-class battlecruiser was a very different proposition from what he knew that the Japanese were sailing around with at the moment. Which, of course, does bring up the point, what were the strengths on the two sides? Now, if you look at a basic order of battle, you might think it's fairly obvious which way things should go. The US has seven fleet carriers, eight light carriers, seven battleships, eight heavy cruisers, 13 light cruisers, and 68 destroyers. The Japanese, on the other hand, have only three fleet carriers, six light carriers, five battleships, but they have 11 heavy cruisers, only two light cruisers, and 31 destroyers. There's a bunch of submarines out there as well, but that's the surface fleet strength. So you might look at it and go, okay, well, we'll write off the carriers in in the immediate term because this is supposed to be a battle line engagement, although obviously there would be air support if it's a daytime fight. You've got seven battleships versus five battleships, Eight heavy cruisers on the American side versus 11 on the Japanese side. So yeah, maybe three heavy cruisers might counterbalance two battleships, maybe with long lances at least. Then you have 13 light cruisers versus two. So definite American advantage there. And 68 destroyers versus 31. Again, definite American advantage there. But what's hidden within that is that both sides have split their forces into a number of groups. The Japanese, for example, have the A force and B force, which are centered on aircraft carriers, and they've absorbed quite a number of destroyers and some of the cruisers. A B force also has one of the battleships, the Nagato, with them. For surface action and leading the Japanese formations is the Van group, and we'll come more to what that involves a bit later on. The American order of battle has Task Group 58.1, which is centred on carriers. Task Group 58.2, which is also centred on carriers. Task Group 58.3, which is, you guessed it, also centred on carriers. And then Task Group 58.4, which, drumroll please, is also centred on carriers. But as well as having four different carrier task groups... There's a lot of cruisers and destroyers assigned to each of these forces. So when we get down to task group 58.7, because it just takes a bit of a jump, we find out what Admiral Lee actually has on hand. And his forces are as follows. He has a pair of Iowa-class battleships, the Iowa and New Jersey. He has three out of the four South Dakota-class ships, the South Dakota, Alabama, and Indiana. The only one that's not present is Massachusetts. And he has the two North Carolina-class battleships, North Carolina and Washington. So he actually has seven out of the eight fast battleships that the U.S. would ever build. He then has four heavy cruisers, the New Orleans-class New Orleans, San Francisco and Minneapolis, and 
and the one off Wichita, which means that he has four heavy cruisers and no light cruisers. And then finally, he has a total of 14 destroyers, one Porter class, one Mahan class, three Bagley class, and nine Fletchers. And so bearing this force in mind, we're going to consider in this video two potential scenarios, one of which has a multiplicity of possible outcomes and the other of which is relatively pedestrian by comparison. Now, here's the kind of map that you quite often see for the historic battle of the Philippine Sea, which is great and all. It's not that useful apart from in very broad terms, because whilst it shows the roots of the US and Japanese fleets, it doesn't really tell us where they are relative to each other. I mean, if you were just to read this map as shown, you'd think that perhaps there was a surface action. I mean, look where those arrows are in the middle. It looks like the two fleets pretty much came broadside to broadside, which is not actually historically what happened. Instead, we can look at something like this, which is a much more detailed map and very helpfully has timestamps and date stamps on it. So bearing in mind that in the book extract we just read, Arleigh Burke was proposing to Admiral Lee in the early morning hours of the 18th that they should do something. Now, what's happening on the 18th with the two sets of forces? Well, here you can see that, well, the map on part on the right, the US fleet actually doesn't pick up until halfway through the 18th. But at that point, the fleet is directly west of Saipan and Tinian. At the roughly the same time on the 18th, the Japanese fleet is somewhere in the last element of its northeastern course. You can see it's at 6 a.m. has turned from almost north to mostly northeast. And then at 3.40 p.m. on the 18th, it's reached the northernmost point of that leg and heads straight south. And then we can see further to the east, the US fleet by 8.30 p.m. on the 18th has reached the westernmost point of its first leg and then doubles back towards Tinian overnight. And during that same time, we can see the Japanese are progressing south. So around about the same time, 8.30 for the Americans, 9 o'clock for the Japanese. On the 18th, the Japanese are most of their way through their southern leg. And obviously the Americans have just turned around. Now, if you look at the tracks of the fleets and where the airstrikes are launched from and over to where the corresponding time and shortly thereafter is for the opposite fleet, you'll notice that actually during the 18th, the two fleets came to either within range of each other or very nearly within air striking range of each other. And more particularly, you can see at 9 p.m. on the 18th, i.e. that evening, the van force cut a hard tack to port. So whereas the two forces primarily centered on carriers, force A and force B, headed south until the early morning hours of the 19th, the van force headed east, did a little circle, and then headed back west by northwest later on. So the van force was standing much further to the east than the Japanese carrier forces, and then later on was shadowing it to sort of roughly a northeasterly position until they rejoined again in the early afternoon of the 20th. So the first part of Burke's comment that if they proceeded further west, that by the end of the 18th, i.e. afternoon of the 18th, they'd be in air striking range, that does seem to hold up. They almost certainly would be, especially when you consider how far the Japanese moved versus how far the Americans moved. You can see that during the 18th, the American fleet wasn't utilizing the full range of its speed options to quite the same degree as the Japanese, although, of course, neither fleet was moving at full pelt. You'll also notice there, in almost centre of the map, that there was a direction-finding fix of the enemy fleet at 8.20pm on the 18th, very shortly before the US fleet historically turned around. So they know almost exactly where they are, although obviously this happens about 40 minutes before the van force breaks away from the carrier forces. Now, whether they would have needed this fix if they'd continued to press west and launched airstrikes in the early afternoon, presumably preceded by scouting missions, is another matter. So, let's assume that Lee has taken up the offer and he says, yes, I will lead my battleships and other forces west and I will engage the Japanese fleet at night. So, 
the rest of the American Carrier Forces are following along slightly further behind. And at some point in the mid to late afternoon, scouting aircraft spot the Japanese fleet. Presumably either around about the time it's about to go from heading almost north to heading south or just after it's started heading south. And so airstrikes are launched. As we recounted in the book extract, the, their primary targets are going to be the Japanese carrier forces. So they're going to bear the brunt of the attack and maybe a few attacks will be launched on the battleship force as well, the van force. But given that it's a relatively short period of time during which these attacks can be launched, you probably are going to get one big strike wave off because then it's going to be nighttime and nobody's going to want to fly in those conditions. So the most of the attacks that the American forces make are likely to be directed against the enemy carriers, which is good for our scenario because it massively decomplicates everything. Because whatever happens to those carrier for task forces, Force A and Force B, really doesn't affect our scenario too much for a night engagement because, as we see, the historically, the van force headed east and is even more likely to do so if the carrier forces have come under attack. And so if Lee proceeds west with his battleships, he is almost certainly going to run into the van force in some way, shape or form. And so if there is going to be a night action, it's probably going to be between Lee's ships and the Japanese van force. So with all that said, what was the van force? And here's the forces that Lee's ships would be facing off against. Now you might, you might notice, first of all, there are still some carriers there. There's three light carriers, Chitose, Chiyoda and Zuiho, but they're not going to be operating any aircraft at night. If anything, at best they're shell magnets, at worst they're just annoying things to have around for this kind of engagement. So although they are there, they're unlikely to factor into the main part of any engagement in any significant sense, unless, of course, there's some case of mistaken identity or they just happen to show up and get shelled. More importantly, however, you can see that both Yamato and Musashi are present, as are the battle cruisers Congo and Haruna. There are four heavy cruisers, the entire Takao class, Atago, Chokai, Maya, and Takao. One light cruiser, the Agano class Noshiro, which is heading up the destroyers, which include the Shibakaze, she of the many torpedoes, seven of the Yugamo class, and one lone Kagero class, the Hamakaze. Or at least that's what they'd started out with. The Hayanami, one of the seven Yugamos, had actually been sunk almost two weeks earlier by a submarine on their way to the engagement zone. Now, you might think, obviously, that this gives the US something of an advantage. They outnumber the Japanese in cruisers by basically two to one, with the floating exception of the Nashiro. But light cruiser though it may be, I think we can all agree that one Agano class light cruiser is not the equivalent of seven destroyers. The heavy cruiser category is a little bit more of an even fight. It's 4v4, they're all heavy cruisers, they're all pretty well designed. And to be fair, the New Orleans class have shown they are not exactly the world's most durable vessels when it comes to night engagements with Japanese heavy cruisers. And the ones they faced at Savo Island were not exactly as powerful, for the most part, as these four. But then we move on to the battleships. And, well, seven versus four tells a story of all of its own. And two of these ships are Congo class, which, you know, Washington, one of the two earliest, least well-protected battleships of the American force had already shown didn't really rate in combat against a modern American fast battleship. Their guns, if loaded with AP shells, could still do some damage, so you can't count them out entirely, but the biggest focus, no doubt, is the two Yamatos, because, well, especially in close-range night action, they can do some serious damage to pretty much anything in the US battle line regardless of whether it's an Iowa, a South Dakota, or a North Carolina. And perhaps more importantly, and this feeds into Admiral Lee's assessment being, in my view, correct, the Japanese forces here were not like the Japanese forces that had been encountered at Guadalcanal. 
Remember when Washington and South Dakota had taken on Kirishima and its associated ships, the Americans had radar, and the Japanese did not, which would give them a decisive advantage. At this point, however, whilst the Americans do have more radar, because it's a really more advanced radar than they'd had in 1942, the Japanese also have surface search radar. Yamato and Musashi have multiple installations thereof, and there's a few other sets distributed throughout their force. Now, as I said, they're not as advanced as the American radar sets, but they can pick up incoming ships at a range that is, well, beyond most reasonable estimations of battle line engagement range for a daylight engagement, let alone where those ranges might be during a nighttime engagement, obviously necessarily going to be a little bit shorter. Not perhaps massively so by 1944. The Iowa's gunnery officer was correct when he said that radar doesn't actually care whether it's night or day, but the fidelity of the radar and therefore at what range it can achieve a target lock is at this point, if you're looking at a fleet-wide basis, going to require that the range is somewhat closer than it would be in a daylight engagement. And so whilst the Americans might know where the Japanese are before the Japanese know where the Americans are, unfortunately a point-blank Kirishima-style ambush of the Japanese fleet simply isn't on the cards. The Japanese are almost certainly going to see the American ships, or at least some of them, before the main fighting commences, even if they're only going to have a few minutes to respond, potentially. Now, at night based on how the various formations of the Japanese and U.S. navies travelled at night in other circumstances, we can make an estimation of roughly what shape these ships would be in relative to each other when they potentially run into each other. The Japanese are probably going to be travelling in two pairs of capital ships, with their cruisers arranged both ahead and to the port and aft quarter behind and they're going to have the destroyers in a loose screen with one or two running behind as well the americans if admiral lee is anything to go by going in knowing that they're expecting a night engagement and now he has you know a few more forces than he had available at guadalcanal are probably going to be going in using a slightly more extended line formation so the battleships will be traveling in a line with a chevron screen of destroyers forward, um, some destroyers scattered either side and aft, and the cruisers probably also on either side and more towards the aft, able to fall back slightly to clear the gun lines very quickly if the battleships need to engage, but also in a position to be able to use their guns to repel incoming attackers if necessary, if they're the ones being attacked first. Uh, this kind of travelling formation is very different from the anti-aircraft focused circular formations that Lee would historically adopt to see off incoming aircraft. So, we mentioned two scenarios, and one of which would have several possible outcomes. And the first one is the longer one. Assuming that this night engagement takes place between the forces as described, we have to look into really three cases. Best case, worst case, middle case. So the best case scenario is somewhat reductive. It's just an expanded version of the night action during the second night of the naval battle of Guadalcanal. In this, we would hypothesize that the American battleships, along with their destroyers and cruisers, are sailing along, and they've got some idea of where the Japanese surface forces might be from some late afternoon reconnaissance. And then the destroyers start to pick up the Japanese formation. Relaying this information back to Admiral Lee, he can work out the enemy's course and speed and put his ships in a position to cross the enemy's T. In this scenario, the cruisers and some of the destroyers would fall back to be aft of the battle line and the rest of the destroyers that were chevroned in front would form a pack on the port bow, assuming for the moment that the fleet is going to pass with its port side facing the enemy. The idea of this would be to keep constant lock on the enemy with radar, 
to limit the Japanese ability to fire back with their heavy guns once they realize what's going on, and also to minimize the advantages that the Long Lance has over the Mark 15, the US surface launch torpedo, because if the Japanese are heading straight at them, then the closing speed between the American torpedoes and their targets is going to be considerably greater, and also the Japanese are quite conveniently closing some of the distance, so you could in theory, launch beyond the range of the American torpedoes, just, and the Japanese would enter range by the time the torpedoes actually hit that outer limit. This has an added advantage in that it forces the Japanese to make a very difficult choice, because obviously firing torpedoes effectively straight down the throat of a formation isn't necessarily going to result in too many hits, because the bow of a, tar of a ship is a relatively small target. But if the Japanese realize that there are torpedoes incoming, then they either have to stay heading in at the Americans, which favors the Americans because they've managed to cross the T, or if they choose to turn to present broadside and l unleash their own torpedoes anyway, they're now presenting their broadsides to the incoming American torpedo salvo, which is going to end much worse for them. And if they don't realize that the torpedoes are incoming and they just turn broadside anyway, well, that's going to have pretty much the same result. In either case, having a relatively steady battle line and the opening advantage means that the American ships should be able to absolutely pummel the Japanese ships in fairly short order. By using radar as their primary method for concentrating their salvos, it's going to make it slightly harder for the various ships to get confused between the shell splashes of different ships targeting different Japanese vessels. And with such a significant advantage in battleship numbers, it's highly likely that Admiral Lee will at least at first allocate some of those battleships to help clear out the smaller Japanese vessels, because their torpedoes pose a fairly significant risk to all of his ships. At which point, the Americans have a significant firepower advantage with their destroyers, and we could say, for instance, that the battle line consists of the two Iowas up front, the two North Carolinas in the middle, and the three South Dakotas aft, and if the three South Dakotas are detailed to deal with the Japanese cruisers, along with obviously the American cruisers, then given their relatively light build, the Japanese cruisers are not going to last very long under that fire, the secondary guns of the battleships, at least the South Dakotas, are going to be concentrating on the Japanese destroyers as well. So there should be a fairly quick wipeout of the Japanese light forces. There will obviously be long lances in the water, there will be fire coming back, and there may even initially be some return fire from the Japanese battleships, but overall American light vessel casualties should be light. And at the same time, you would have the lead four battleships dueling with the four Japanese ships. The Japanese would be somewhat aware of what's going on, having spotted the American formation shortly before the Americans opened fire, but Admiral Lee probably would have been keeping all his ships on a wait-until-they-twitch order, and then the guns fire. So, two Congos potentially being engaged by two North Carolinas, well, we know how this story ends. <laughs> We've seen it already at Guadalcanal. It'll take a few minutes, but I don't think Congo and Harana have much of a chance in this circumstance. The two Iowas dueling it out with the two Yamatos, and we're anticipating that this engagement is probably taking place at medium range for battleships, is a lot closer of a fight. Both sides are eminently capable of hurting each other. But in this more optimistic scenario, the Americans have already got their radar-targeted gun locks achieved, and of course their overall theoretical rate of fire and their rate of train and elevation is better than that of the 18.1-inch guns. So they're getting in more accurate salvos sooner, and hopefully relatively quickly suppress the Yamato's ability to fire back, especially with their secondary batteries probably also engaging, obviously the secondaries aiming at the superstructure, the battleships, main guns, shooting at whatever they can get. There'll probably be some hits in return, and those will probably hurt very badly, but depending on who finishes off who sooner, either the South Dakotas or possibly the North Carolinas, or possibly both, will eventually wind up coming in to help finish off the two Yamatos. In this potential scenario, the most likely outcome would 
like possibly be one, maybe two American cruisers sunk or damaged, maybe three or four American destroyers in the same circumstances, and anything from two to three American battleships damaged to some degree. This, of course, would be a great crushing victory, but with damaged and sinking vessels around, and obviously no strict guarantee that absolutely every Japanese ship is gone and not able to fire things like, you know, a last minute long launch salvo, Admiral Lee would probably break away east and signal Mitcher to finish off any survivors and, of course, any survivors of the Japanese carrier groups the following morning with aircraft. By contrast, the worst case scenario would be the one that Lee apparently seems to have at least considered, if not necessarily entirely worried about. The ships obviously have less than optimal amounts of surface-to-surface -surface gunnery training more recently, and crucially, as Lee pointed out, he's not entirely confident that they have a lot of training in the communications necessary for a night action. Now, granted, at the action of Guadalcanal, where South Dakota and Washington were operating, electrical failures meant that South Dakota wasn't able to communicate with Washington. But if the communications protocols are unclear or captains aren't quite up to speed with following them, we can hypothesize a worst case scenario where the American battle line is proceeding and perhaps an outriding Japanese destroyer spots them and communicates back their location before it's probably inevitably destroyed by American gunfire. Now, as the Japanese fleet comes in for action, there are two crucial advantages that they have compared to the last scenario. One, although the Americans will see where the main formation of the Japanese fleet is first, the Japanese have a pretty good idea not only that the Americans are out there, period, but be where they are. So they have more time to prepare for action, deploy their formation, etc., etc. And that's the second part of the advantage, because not only do they know where the Americans are, they're also able to get ready for it. And by knowing roughly where the Americans are, they can set their course thus... And so in a worst case scenario, after the destruction of the Japanese destroyer that basically tells everyone what's going on, the Japanese shape out into a battle line and they head towards the Americans on a approximately 45 degree course, give or take a 5-10 degrees, trying to force a closing engagement between battle lines. And they're able to do this hypothetically relatively quickly. When they do this, the American ships are a little confused as to what they should be doing, because, as I said, they haven't quite practiced how to communicate with each other fully. And whilst Lee is getting them under control, it costs them a few minutes, which are pretty vital, because all of a sudden, unbeknownst to the Americans, a lot of long lances have suddenly entered the water. Specifically, just over a hundred of the things... And that's before the four cruisers might be able to turn and use their other broadside of torpedoes later in the battle. And of course, the Japanese destroyers will be carrying reloads. With these torpedo launches coming at around the same time that the main gun engagement is starting, Lee now faces a very difficult decision. He can either keep the battle line in formation, which will help with gunnery, obviously, or he can break the formation and turn away. Now, with radar-guided gunnery and fire control systems, manoeuvring at night or at all isn't quite as negative an experience as it would have been a couple of years earlier. But with the communications issues plaguing the fleet, it could lead to collisions, it could lead to ships getting lost, and more importantly, by disrupting the formation, it's probably going to throw off the aim of various ships, because... When radar picks up a contact, it doesn't helpfully tag it with Yamato, Musashi, Congo, Harona. It's just large contacts at a distance. You can shoot at them, but if things are disrupted, when you come to look again, well, you may see a large contact, but was it the same large contact you were shooting at before or not? Who knows? And so, again, hypothetical worst-case scenario could go one of two ways. Either 
for whatever reason, either because Lee decides it's the lesser of the two evils or because ships just don't get the message, the American battle line generally continues onwards, shoots merrily away at the Japanese, who are obviously merrily shooting back, right before uh, several dozen long lances arrive. The first notion of trouble is probably going to be a destroyer getting atomized just off the port bow of the American battle line. But then you're going to have several thousand pound warhead impacts all along the battleships. That's going to slow some of them down, which is going to throw the formation out. Others potentially taking multiple hits on the same side might start to actually founder. Damage control crews are going to do the best they can, obviously, but these launches have taken place at a bit closer range than the Battle of the Java Sea, and of course, a line of battleships is a significantly larger target than destroyers and small cruisers. Now, whilst this very successful torpedo salvo might not hit all the battleships, and indeed it might not overly trouble the, some of the ones that are hit, although to be fair, a thousand pound warhead detonating is a little bit more than what the American torpedo defense systems are designed to handle, the main problem is that it's disrupting the engagement of the Japanese ships. And again, hypothetical worst case scenario, some of the American ships are falling back, the ones that are recovering and able to continue fighting make a fatal mistake. A couple of the battleships target Yamato, and in so doing, they miss Musashi. Kongo and Haruna are still getting badly worked over, but Musashi basically has the equivalent of what Deflinger had at the Battle of Jutland, uninterrupted practice fire. And very soon 18.1 inch shells have crippled, or possibly even destroyed, at least mortally wounded, one, maybe two further battleships. At this point, Lee's active fighting battleships are l approximately equal numbers to the operational Japanese battleships. And by this point, the surviving Japanese cruisers and destroyers, who will have been ferociously fighting their American opposite numbers, will at least have got some reloads left. By the light of burning ships and with searchlights going off all over the place, Lee almost certainly recognises that there's going to be a second follow-up salvo of long lances, which is not going to be a good thing, and so he would order his surviving ships to double back to try and protect, or at least assist, the other disabled and crippled battleships and other ships further behind, whilst calling, obviously, for Mitcher to send in as much aircraft reinforcement as he can as soon as light allows. Now, the Japanese ships will have been quite badly worked over. As I said, the Congos probably are not going to be in the best of shapes. Yamato, having been double teamed, probably also not in the best of shapes. And so with a second torpedo salvo that's more of a and stay away from us kind of event rather than a hard pressed attack, the Japanese forces, or at least what's left of them, probably melt away into the darkness. Now, Technically speaking, by seeding the battlefield, it is an American victory, and the chances of the surviving Japanese ships lasting very long the next morning against a very, very angry and vengeful set of carrier air groups, well, overall the Japanese will probably lose most of their ships. But, in terms of the actual gun and night action, it's going to be a much more debatable scenario, because whilst... The Japanese will have lost some ships and had others damaged, most likely the combination of 18.1 inch gunfire and long lances mean that the Americans will have either lost or had damaged sig badly significantly more of their capital ships. And so, as perhaps some holes slip under the water and others are taken in tow, the American fast battleship line is left massively reduced as, to be fair, are their escorts. And all it took was a few extra minutes of Japanese preparation and a slight screw-up in the series of communications within Lee's task force. And now perhaps you can understand why Lee wasn't too keen on undertaking this action. The middle case scenario is somewhat hard to estimate precisely. Under the most likely overall 
uh, circumstances of engagement. There will be a ferocious fight between destroyers and cruisers, but the Japanese will be unleashing their long lances in fairly large numbers. So whilst gunfire will probably rapidly overwhelm and destroy or drive off the Japanese lighter forces, it really comes down to how many long lances hit. Sure, some Japanese gunfire will probably total or badly damage some of the American lighter forces, but many of the losses are going to be a roll of the dice of did that destroyer catch a long lance or not, because if it didn't, that destroyer might otherwise be relatively fine, and if it did, well, that's probably mm, that's so long for this world for the destroyer. Similarly, a few long lances that leak through may or may not damage or even badly damage some of the battleships but it's somewhat less likely if the Japanese have to worry about the more immediate problem of shooting at a bunch of angry Fletchers who are coming to try and destroy them. The battleship engagement should go quite heavily in the Americans' favour. It is, after all, 7 versus 4 and as we said before the Congos don't really rate too highly in this line engagement but... In a reasonable engagement scenario, the 18.1-inch shells, well, are still 18.1-inch AP shells. There is every likelihood that one or more American battleships are going to be quite badly damaged by return fire. It only takes one or two salvos to land for something of that size to do some pretty nasty effects. And so, whilst Lee's force the following morning will be victorious, and possibly still have all its battleships afloat, an unlucky combination of 18.1 inch shells and long lances, or just a very, very luckily placed one of either, could see more one or two heading to the bottom, even if slowly. But Lee's force overall will be successful with a relatively positive kill rate. The main issue is going to be that even if none of the battleships are outright sunk, there's going to be a lot of towing and slow manoeuvring back to safe harbour and Lee's overall battleship force is going to be somewhat diminished. Now in the immediate term that's probably not going to matter too much because once again the carrier air groups the next morning are probably going to finish off the survivors both of their own attacks the previous night and obviously anything that survived Lee's forces but going forward when more air attacks come about and perhaps even weeks or months later during the invasion of other islands, with significantly fewer available battleships because they're either being repaired or possibly even replaced, there could be further ongoing American casualties as more Japanese ships get past a now reduced American screen. Still, it would be quite an impressive victory and would, of course, be the last major line confrontation between multiple battleships on either side. You'll notice in all this we didn't mention the three light carriers because, to be frank, in any scenario, their best course of action is just to get out of the way. Worst case scenario, they just get mopped up towards the end of the battle. The other scenario is one that Lee mentioned, so perhaps he does go west to try and find the Japanese line, but somehow the van of the Japanese force and the American battleships miss each other in the night and Lee decides to double back to form the anti-aircraft screen that he's historically would do. At this point the Battle of the Philippine Sea would progress broadly along the same lines as it did historically with the exception being that just after three o'clock in the afternoon on the 20th when the sighting of the Japanese fleet is received, Lee's task group is unleashed and heads straight for it, whilst more details are confirmed. Along the way, they would be overhauled by and presumably wave at the American aircraft that are being sent to strike the Japanese forces, but by the time night falls and they spot the American aircraft heading back, again they're able to of course get a very reliable fix on where the Japanese are, they continue closing at full speed as early night falls, and then on the evening of the 20th, as the damaged and limping Japanese forces are heading away, they're detected on radar by Lee's forces, which gradually overhaul them and begin to gobble them up Pac-Man style, which, to be honest, is a fairly spectacular victory, but probably not the most interesting scenario, because there's precious little at that point that the Japanese are going to be able to do about it. With the sole exception that if 
heavily attacked, the van force may double back and try and force a knight action, battle line versus battle line again. But it's perhaps more likely that using their various ships' high speeds, the Japanese fleet would take the more pragmatic course of just setting course away from the Americans at the absolute maximum possible speed they could manage, which broadly is still going to be faster than the overall American battle line speed is, thanks to the fact that the South Dakotas and North Carolinas are going to be around 28 knots. And those will just try and preserve their aircraft carriers. So a few extra ships will be picked off, but not too many, as I said, unless a major battle line action develops. But at that point, that's probably going to trend more to the slightly optimistic side of things when we look at the potential engagement over the night of the 18th, 19th, as opposed to the more negative one, because the Americans are going in with all the information and primed and ready to fight, whereas the Japanese are going to be somewhat confused and trying to organize a desperate last stand to save their remaining carriers as opposed to anything else. So there's some options as to how the Battle of the Philippine Sea could have progressed had Lee decided to commit his surface forces to an action as opposed to letting it be fought out mostly by aircraft. If you think that something else might have happened or you want to make some other comment as to the scenarios presented then please feel free to say so in the comments below as of always of course these are alternate history considerations and anything could have happened we've just broadly tried to consider best worst and reasonable mid-case scenarios for what would have been an incredibly complex and very open to roll of the dice luck set of engagements that's it for this video Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.